Welcome to the lunchtime debate here at Fintech Talents Virtual North America. I am your host, Bradley Lamer, co-founder of Unconventional Ventures. And I'm really excited to be leading this session. We've got four great guests today to discuss what we're calling the heartland of banking. While we're just setting this up as a debate, I think what you'll key into each one of our panelists is that the banking model is not just continuing to evolve from the way we've reacted to this pandemic to the way we're thinking about the industry's future. But at the heart of everything we do is how we define our communities and how we remain focused on who we're privileged enough to serve. Technology comes and goes. Financial needs change over time. But at the very heart of financial services, this remains a very human endeavor. The ways we could help our communities really matters. So our panelists today are among those that are indeed serving the needs of their respective communities and have the heartland of banking at their very core. I wanna start this debate by having you all introduce yourselves and your institution and answer the following question. How does your financial institution define the communities in which you serve. So Huma, let's start with you. Tell us about Radius Bank and the way you think about community. Thanks, Bradley. Um, so I'm Huma Usmani, and um, I manage strategic partnerships and technology for Radius Bank. Uh, Radius Bank itself is around $1.5 billion in asset size. We are headquartered in Boston, in Massachusetts. And uh, we have around 70 employees across the United States. So traditionally, um, the idea of community buying geography and location. But at Radius, uh, a little different. We believe that the community banking platform should not be tied to physical geography, but rather to address the different needs of our customers looking for a convenience of technology without need of a physical branch. And to serve our communities better, we actually, um, around 10 years ago, went through digital transformation, um, shut down a digital uh, bank, uh, a forward-thinking digital bank, uh, which could enable its customers to use their phones, their tablets, and their, com their computers for banking needs. Uh, within the community banking aspect also, we are very focused on small medium businesses, and we have been an SBA lender since 2008. We were able to stand up a PPP program uh, within a week, and around 5,000 small businesses, and over 75,000 people have had to receive the paycheck through Radius Bank. So we're very pleased to have um, helped with small medium businesses in that respect. Josh, what about you? The, the story of Lead Bank is really a fascinating one. Tell us about you know, your story and, and how you guys define community there. That's terrific. I'm really happy to be here. So Lead Bank is a, is, um, a kind of a de novo bank essentially built on a 90-year-old community bank um, tradition. Um, I'm the CEO. Um, my family acquired this bank in 2005, and it was a one-location uh, community bank. And we began growing it, but, um, but around the time of the financial crisis of 2008, nine, uh, we were really, uh, we really had some big problems. And at that time we had to kind of confront an existential question is like, what do we, what do we exist to do? And uh, fundamentally what we decided is that in order to exist, we would go back to first principles of community banking. And we would say, what is at the heart of community banking and why is it relevant today? And um, how can we make sure that we are relevant? Um, fast forward to today, um, we define our success as um, our mission as to be at the heart of the success of our communities. And what essentially that reflects in our view is that any one of us, any member of this panel, any member of this audience really exists within multiple communities. Some are say, technology savvy early adopters. Some are um, seniors. You could be that and you could be a senior citizen and you could be um, LGBTQIA. You could exist within multiple communities. And if that's true, the community bank exists to serve you in all of your identities, to serve people how they identify themselves. And to, to Huma's point, geography 
is passe. It's a, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really define people in the same way that maybe it once did now that we have the communication and the, and the, the networks that we participate in. So that's how we define community. That is on the basis of the multiple complementary identities that any person has. And to say, can we find through technology and innovation a solution that, that will deliver something meaningful to you, that will enable success in the way that you feel it for your community as you've defined it. And we think that's the opportunity of technology because it democratizes, the, uh, uh, it, it democratizes banking. It should open banking up to people, particularly people that because of their community identification, say, as a person of color have, um, or a woman, have been so marginalized and so discriminated by banking. So that's kind of how we define uh, the heart of our community mission. Well, I, I love that idea that we all have um, multiple communities that, that we're part of. That's, that's a great way to kind of look at it. Let's switch over to Lisa at Vero Money. So you just received your national bank charter, and that's really exciting. Um, you've got so much opportunity in front of you, but you guys have done so much. So tell us a little bit more about Vero. Absolutely. Thanks, Brad. It's great to be in this esteemed panel. So Lisa Violet, Chief Auditor of Varo Money, Varo, which is now Varo Bank. And yes, we just at, at August 1st got our, as a fintech consumer, we're the first to get a national charter by the regulators. Really big moment for us, really big moment for the United States and the financial services market. And what is our community? Who are we solving for? The founder, Colin Walsh, years ago saw that there was a big contingent of people who weren't getting their needs met by traditional banks. And what he set out to do with the advent of technology was to set out on this path to be America's first chartered national digital bank. And to Josh's point and Uma, you know, how we define community is no longer just your physical location. The location is on the cell phone. It could be on the computer. So our community are more or less those folks that have been unserved or new to banking, and also maybe that new millennia who's agnostic and is maybe of that generation where they wanted to go all digital from the outset. You know, our community may evolve over time. You know, just as Josh just described, they are a de novo bank with a 90 year history. Uma's bank also is redefining geography. Varo itself is also redefining banking. And I would almost say it's almost like an impact. We're making an impact in the market to really serve the underserved and the new to banking, and also those that just want a digital first. But we are part of an ecosystem. So it's not um, an attitude of us versus them. We're really all in this together. And Varo Bank is really here to redefine and offer a community of folks that want to come here and belong to our mission and purpose. And we, we have this kind of larger kind of societal impact that we really want to come to the market with. That's awesome. Um, so let's let's move on then to, to Jesse. So I've been following Cross River Bank for a long, long time. You've built this amazing tech stack for your clients, but your community is a little bit different. So tell us about your history and what you guys are doing. Yeah. So, um, Cross River is kind of an interesting bank. And so Jesse Honigberg, um, SVP, um, chief of staff for the technology group and um, Bradley and, and the rest of the team behind you. Thanks for having us. You know, we're really happy to, to speak, especially to this topic. Um, you know, Cross River has really um, prided itself on making deep investments in our technology stack and then figuring out how we extend that stack out to you know, partners who define community in their own terms. And so for us, partner is a key way of thinking about who we serve and how we extend our reach. And so, um, you know, there's some very large fintechs that we provide the back end for, and, and ultimately they help define communities in their own context. And in many ways, the way that people move money, the way that they think about money is it constantly evolving. And, you know, the definition of community as I think that everyone has spoken to is really, um, you know, something that's very hard to, to nail down, especially in this day and age. And we think it'll continue to become more diverse. And our goal is to make sure that banking moves seamlessly into those communities and allows people to um, really think about how banking can be form, become a form of enablement 
um, and allow you to move seamlessly between the the people who you want to deal with in, in a particular context. And our platforms and, and services are really designed to extend that reach directly to our, our fintech partners and also to large enterprises who are starting to define community in their own terms as well. So it's been a fantastic journey. Um, you know, I think Uma, you know, uh, kind of mentioned the PPP as well, but, you know, Thanks to some of the reach that that we were able to do um, and, and our stack and some of the investments, we've made, um, you know, over two or just about two hundred thousand uh, PPP loans, um, and you know we're third largest PPP originator in terms of units in the country. And a lot of that was a result of these deep investments and working with fintech partners. So those weren't all people coming to Cross River; that was people coming to Cabbage or coming to Blue Vine or coming to Intuit, um, and us building the back end and APIs that allow them to fund and serve those those customers. Um, many of whom were turned down by by larger banks. So we're excited about what the our past was, and we're even more excited about what the future holds for communities. Well, and when we think about examples like um, PPP and like what all the different banks and fintechs working together really really showed us was that community is is much more even within our industry and who, how we serve, who we serve. Um, so let's shift gears a little bit and, and let's talk about that scale. Uh, the largest national banks in the U.S. have garnered more market share over the last decade, you know, since the Great Recession. They're controlling almost three quarters of all loans, over 80 percent of deposits. So how can we help smaller financial institutions and fintechs compete? You know, just as more and more large non-financial technology companies from, you know, Google and Apple and Facebook and others are trying to get into payments and credit and what have you. Um, how are we going to do that? So Uma, let's let's start with you and Radius Bank. Let's talk about, you know, you talk about creating Amazon like experiences with your clients. So how are you enabling your partners to be more innovative? So Bradley, um, around five years ago, um, Radius Bank decided to partner with Fintex. Amazon-like experience where customers could open digitally an account uh, with us in less than three minutes. And um, in order to get there, we worked with FinTech to improve our technology platforms for our direct retail partners and products. Um, so we partnered with a few FinTechs such as Mantle for our consumer account opening process, um, Treasury Prime for our business account opening process, and broad risk KYC and AML. Uh, we further deepened our relationships with these fintechs by making some strategic investments with them. And then on top of that, we, for our indirect fintech partners, we built on this uh, to provide a banking as a service platform, uh, which would enable these fintechs to be able to offer innovative products, banking products to their customers uh, without needing uh, through the, through the, uh, this particular uh, vast platform, uh, these fintech partners were able to open and manage their accounts uh, while still um, owning the front end piece of the online and mobile banking experience for their clients. And then, you know, they can also use um, our core systems and our infrastructure tech stack without actually building on their own infrastructure. Um, and then they can also use the open source model and provide the customer with a great customer experience, which is kind of where we kind of lead up to the fact that we're not only providing that Amazonian experience to our direct retail products, but also to our fintech partners, we're able to provide that to their customers as well. That's great. And, and Jesse, along those lines, Cross River is doing sort of the same thing, but perhaps maybe a different approach. So tell us a little bit about that and maybe some of the success stories that you guys have had. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the biggest and, and most interesting thing we think about banking as a service, and and I think I, I give a, a lot of credit to uh, Uma and, and her team, and, and we're using some great partners like um, like Mantle as well for some of our experiences. But, you know, for us, banking as a service is really about how we take something that's really poorly defined right now, because it means something different to everybody. You know, um, 
I just saw a press release that another bank was getting into banking as a service and they were really just doing a very, they were doing bin sponsorship, but it's okay, right? It's great because everyone is starting to talk about it. And for us, what banking as a service means and how we think about it in the context of community banking is how do we take the stack that we built and delivered and, and really is being consumed by fintechs and how do we go down market or up market or cross market? And, and for us, that means supporting our community banking brethren and, and saying, can we take our products and our investments and make it relevant and contextually aware and, and accessible for them? And so um, stuff that we've built for clients like Coinbase, where they're trying processing a huge number of payments through us. Um, they're using our virtual ledgering system. And a lot of the, the very interesting things that we've done, all of that stuff could in some ways be extended to community banks. And especially if you have the right use case, you can help them solve big problems in a very digestible, you know, kind of in a box way. And it's I think the most important thing and the and I think that probably what many of the listeners here will relate to is that we don't want to move at the speed of FIS. We don't want to move at the speed of Pfizer or Jack Henry. They're all partners. You know, everybody has a little bit of them everywhere in their infrastructure, right? But, you know, the idea is can we take some of these investments and can we make community banking quick? Can we make it, you know, scope down a problem and actually figure out how you solve something and make a customer delighted? And then how do we really make it approachable? And so we're thinking about banking as a service and specifically in the nature of how do we extend it to community banking along those metrics um, and taking some of the investments we've made to serve, you know, kind of these very large fintech clients and, and you know, making it relevant to community banks. Yeah, I think uh, speed is probably at the heart of banking right now. 100%. So absolutely. Um, so, so, Josh, you come from a little bit different starting point. You know, Lead Bank has an 80-year-plus history in your community. You've rebranded, you've expanded your approach to who you serve, as you talked about. Um, how are you competing in this market, and how do you guys stay innovative? Well, it's a, it's the daily question, you know, it's the daily question. Um, but we started um, really with a very kind of, a, in some ways, a conservative mindset, which was to say, um, credit risk is is very dangerous. Um, and so what can we do to reduce our credit risk and diversify our, our sources of income away from credit risk? So the first thing we did is we began um, to really try to explore building the compliance and the systems that would be necessary for high volume ACH and wire uh, payment processors. And that was that was, you know, seven years ago that we began that. But that allowed us to start to think about the investments that you would make in a back end, that is, you know, the non-retail, the non-branch, but to the, the whole set of services that you need in terms of compliance, technology, BSA, and all the rest of it. So that then led us to start exploring what we are, what we're all talking about is kind of service to fintech innovators um, in terms of, you know, providing that banking, uh, that access to the banking system. And so we've we've developed uh, relationships with uh, um, a consumer credit building company out of Texas that's that's generating very um, very significant account volumes for people that have just essentially been uh, put in a position where they don't have because they don't have a banking relationship they don't have a very good way to to establish a credit score. And that relationship then becomes one that we can, as um, we can think about the other kind of bank appropriate, that is community bank appropriate kinds of products, you know, that people need to become more fully in control and more fully vested in their own, in, in their own well-being. So, um, and we've expanded our payments uh, likewise to a, uh, to serving um, as a payment processing, a, serving payment processors in the cannabis business. Um, you know, and a lot of people are like get all alarmed about that. And, and admittedly, there are reasons to be alarmed about it. But we really feel like that that um, that, you know, it's all over. But the shouting, basically, uh, the, the decision is going to be made and that and that um, processing those kinds of payments for businesses that have been really that are excluded is part of what we can do and part of ways that we can innovate. So those are just a couple of examples as we continue to think about ways that finding opportunities that, that don't ordinarily come to a community bank in, in the Kansas City area. That's part of our, our challenge is that uh, we have to be a little bit more aggressive because we simply don't have um, 
the kind of access to big technology centers and, and to the big to the big cities. That's where we need to, to be uh, resourceful and find our own niche. And then when we, when we think about, you know, banking and banking for all of the communities that we serve, like you said, uh, I think cannabis banking and other opportunities are going to present themselves to community banks um, in ways that, you know, they haven't before. So that's good to hear about. Uh, Lisa, you're one of the most preeminent sort of fintech success stories. So as we switch back to you, we talk about growth. Uh, since the beginning of this year, your account growth is up 60%. Your customer spend is up one and a half times over this period, and your deposits are up three and a half times. In October of last year, you had a million customers, and now you have over two million. So what do you guys do for an encore? Um, how can community institutions sort of emulate a little bit of that success that you guys have found? That's a great question, Brad. So how do we do an encore? The encore is the power of the charter and the power of the tech stack and being relevant to what the consumer needs. And... We're, we have seen a definite interest and demand for what we have to offer. And I think building on what Josh talked about, you know, what we are seeing is how people work is different than say our parents in that there's a lot of gig economy where people have kind of shorter sprints of work, contract base, or there's kind of such a, a swift change of business models that people are very transient right now in the workforce. And that type of, of employee or contractor has a different financial need. Traditional credit products looked at a, a set job, you know, for five, 10, 20 years, and the credit products reflected that. It's not, it, now it's more pay as you go, more payments. So the, the power of our bank is, you know, with this kind of all digital outset, we, we saw at first a big demand for just traditional payments. So people pay as they go. And you know, a lot of people are using Venmo and Zelle. And we, we kind of really saw that shift and brought solutions so that that person can have that payment needs and bring it back into their kind of call home bank. And what now that we have the charter, we are also going to be extending our product capabilities. And we've already started in bringing traditional lending products, but lending products really suited to what that consumer needs. So there's kind of more micro loans, more micro consumer loans. People may not necessarily be opting to buy a house. They may rent. They may want shorter purchases for consumer goods. So, you know, that encore is really going to come from continuing to build on that, that tech stack and also continue to build on that charter. That charter allows us as well to provide lending and have leverage like a traditional bank, but it always has to come back to the customer. And how could, how could other community banks and other banks on the call here in the conference kind of emulate what we have done? I think on the panel here, we have some terrific examples of the breadth and diversity of how you can emulate this. So, um, you know, using Lead Bank, you know, they have reinvented community. Looking at Cross River has really partnered and bringing banking as a service. And then Radius is a perfect example of bringing it all together. I think all the folks on the call with a traditional bricks and mortar bank can revisit that banking platform and say, is it, is it digital enough? Is it leveraging partners? And, you know, today we're talking about payments and credit products and deposits. But what is around the corner, that encore and what we can all do is always keep looking at what's next. We haven't touched on cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, but that's coming. You know, a lot of companies are saying, if you're not thinking about cryptocurrency in three to five years, it'll be similar to early 90s saying, I don't know about that internet thing. I, I'm going to stick with my on-premise. <laughs> um, but if, if you did not innovate for the internet, you would have totally missed the 90s and into the new millennia. And if you did not look at the mobile phone 2005, you would have missed the moment of how everybody went to the cell phone. And so I'm putting a challenge back to all of us as well. We, we have a lot of innovative technology right now. We are really in tune to what the consumer needs, both legacy and fintech alike. But we also, too, have to look at what's around the corner. Yeah, absolutely. And can't agree with that more. Um, so let's talk about what's around the corner and what's been happening now. Um, when we talk about the heartland of banking and who we serve, COVID-19 and this pandemic has been so impactful on this country and on the globe. 
and on the industry of banking and on our customers and our clients. So let's talk about how your teams have been impacted, either how you've been working remote or how your customers have changed. Just let's talk about what we've been experiencing, because again, that's at the heart of what we do. It's not just change and reaction. It's, wow, what is happening now? So Josh, let's start with you. Um, you wrote this great post about lead bank's reaction to COVID and the pandemic. And you started it out by quoting Shakespeare's Hamlet. You said, the readiness is all. So let's talk about lead bank <clears throat> and your community and your workers' reaction, especially the part where you singled out, you know, how you're going to support the women in your organization, because that's that's a part of the story that we don't talk about, we don't hear enough about. Well, um, I think this the idea of of readiness is is it really speaks to Lisa's last point about you know what what's around the corner, and you know I think the thing is that that. What has historically, I think, bedeviled and, and hamstrung our industry is a sense of complacency and entitlement about what people need from us and about our relevance. And so I think what COVID kind of produces in me and makes me think about is re remixing, recalibrating the question of what is relevant what is, um, and what are we ready for? Because if, you know, if we don't acknowledge that, our, that we are implicated in a global ecosystem and we, we think that we are, um, we think that we're okay. We are okay here, we're okay. Kansas City, we're okay. The, the pandemic shows that we're not okay. Um, you know, Missouri is a hot spot. So, so then what do you do? Well, if, it, if you translate that to banking, the question is, we are not immune. The position of a community bank in Kansas City, Missouri is, is, is challenged by the very growth in market share that you identified at the beginning of this call, Bradley. It's, it's, it's right there in front of us. So what does that mean? I think it actually means for us that we have to overinvest in our uh, preparedness. We have to do things that, that banks didn't do before, which is really think in the way that, that Jesse and, and Radius um, and Huma are talking about, and that is overinvesting in our technology. We don't know what, we don't know necessarily what for, but we know that if we don't, we're going to be doomed to irrelevance, to incapacity. So with that respect, in that respect, I think you asked a question about what are we doing for our workforce? I've got to say, I think the only thing that we're doing for our workforce that's meaningful is, by, is saying to them, we are going to listen to your need and try to help you through it. Because I don't know what an individual bank does, honestly, about the fact that we have uh, stagnant middle-class incomes in this country. We have no childcare infrastructure. I cannot provide childcare for my staff. We don't have enough money to do that. We just can't do it. But, I but think we lack a solution for that in our country, adequate attention to childcare. So what does that mean? It means we've got to figure out and be in good communication with our staff about what they need. Right. What could we do? Is it a stipend? Is it something else to enable you to feel a sense of uh, uh, security and calm as you try to do your work and raise your family? And that's, that, there's no answer to that question except trying to understand that the first community that we have to be successful for is the community of the people that are stakeholders in our success. That is our success, our bank. Yeah, and I, I just I like that you recognize though in that letter that you know women are shouldering the responsibility overwhelmingly more uh, during the pandemic because of childcare needs and just you know the the change in the way that our day to day is happening. So just um, you know we need to be more and more aware, like you said, of what's happening to our own employees and how it's impacting our family lives. So I mean, most of our people, most of our people are women. So. If that's if we know that's true, if women are shouldering the, the second and third shift in their households, then we have to be a lot more proactive. We have to overinvest. And that changes that changes a lot of things. It changes kind of what our returns are going to look like. But but we know that if we don't, 
we're going to be behind. We're going to, we're going to screw it up if we don't, because we have to be ready for the next thing. And it's not like, it's not like there's going to be another uh, global pandemic. We know that for sure. Right. Whether it's this disease or another, we're going to have to be ready. I think that's a, I think that one of the the big challenges, right, and and that Josh highlighted, and, and, you know, I'm probably the the lone exception, and, you know, Crossover is partially reopened, and I'm in the office today, um, is that context is everything. And I think that what's, what, what we've learned through um, the pandemic, and, um, you know, we continue to grow and, and evolve as an organization, is that we need to understand and be aware that what work is, is defined as much by the the employer by the colleague as it is by the uh, the employer, right? You know, giving someone work and saying I need it by X means that you need it by X and let them find their way there, as opposed to being prescriptive, um, which is almost impossible in this day and age, right? Um, and and COVID made it even more complex. So I think that for us, it's very much about we hire the right people, we give them the right level of agency. We provide, you know, sufficient structure. They understand what the boundaries are, but we empower them to get things done. And we empower them to think about what's the the best way to do things and how do they have the context of their decisions. So um, as, you know, community banks think about what, you know, the the new world looks like and and how they get the most out of their employees. And and certainly um, I agree with Josh that, you know, that, our female employees have, have shouldered a huge burden on um, balancing, you know, uh, everything that goes along with their job plus the life, your family life. And, and my wife is among the, the, you know, I don't know where I would be without her, but we need to also think about how we empower people to really be the agents of change within our organization and not be so prescriptive with, with how we're going to get from A to B. That COVID has taught us that we can't plan for the unplanned. And we need to really empower our people to really own the journey as much as we work with them to understand the destination. And I think that's really what we think about um, at Cross River and, and the change that this has really accelerated. So, so jumping off on that point then and taking care of people in sort of new ways during this pandemic, um, Lisa, let's go back to you a little bit. I mean, you're, you're, you're sort of now like an, a large national bank. You've got this huge customer base that you have to take care of. And you're sort of reintroducing now this idea of what a big bank can be. Um, early on in this pandemic, you help customers get early access to government stimulus funds, which I find fascinating. You also partnered with Steady uh, to help the unemployed find additional work. So what have, what have you guys learned since March and, and how are your users, um, or your, your customers using the bank differently? Brad, what we've learned to borrow with the advent of COVID-19 was just how relevant our bank is and what we had set out to do. It seemed almost like we met the moment. We didn't plan for COVID, but it seems that VARO provided a solution. Um, the same way a couple of the banks here on this call pivoted and allowed for the small business, the PPP loan, we also pivoted and were there to help these folks get their stimulus payments. And we partnered at a level of scale to really, because a lot of these people didn't even have a bank account, right? That's how it was administered. So our technology and our business nimbleness made us able to respond and anticipate and even deepen what we were going to do. And we, we stood up some additional products to really help with kind of, you know, short-term shortage in cash flow. Um, there's another thing that happened this year, and you know, it's it's a message that the purpose of a corporation is really changing from purely return on investment and the shareholder to this concept of stakeholder, of which the employees are also a stakeholder and also the the customer. And you know, I think what came at the back of the pandemic, which showed a lot of people lost work, a lot of people could not work, in particularly in industries where in the hospitality where you had to be with people so all those people were impacted right away and we collectively everybody here on this call was there to help these folks in one way or another and in VAR we did it in a big way but what followed at end of May into June was something horrific I mean we had had you know a lot of 
understanding that we you know there were shifts in the middle class in the United States, you know, more of the have and have nots, but the racial unrest that came to lay bare and still continues right now is also telling us something else in that uh, when we look at, at banks and the purpose of a corporation, we have to be relevant and serve everybody. And it's almost that kind of hyper personalization of your banking product because financial wellness is part of our wellness altogether. And I, I think what we're witnessing here in the United States right now is the need for more novel and needed solutions so that everybody has a piece of the American dream. And that American dream for some may not be a mortgage, a 30 year mortgage. That American dream could be a partner where they can have payments that they can do and they can have micro loans. For somebody else, they're a small business. You know, a lot of the American economy is built on small and medium enterprises. The big banks, you know, you talked earlier on in the outset of their huge market share, but think about that big whale in the ocean. It, it's, it feeds everything that's down beneath it. Where's the plankton of our economy? And where is the plankton in banking? And this is where, where companies like Faro, you know, our purpose is, is very intentional about the underserved and new to banking, and also those that just want to have a digital banking alternative. It doesn't mean it's the only one, but that's who we're serving. Um, we are also seeing that, and I think Josh pointed it out, we always have to be ready for the unexpected. So in terms of our own company, we have a tech stack, we're fully digital, um, but that doesn't mean that we're, we, we have thought it all out. We, we have to continually do scenario planning and crisis management. And sometimes the crisis that shows up at your door is not an earthquake, it's not a pandemic, but it's a societal outrage of injustice. I mean, who would have thought? And, you know, for myself, I'm the chief auditor of VARO. You know, I'm there to really help protect that charter that we have the controls and risk practices in place so that we are safe and sound. But a voice came out that I didn't even know I had, and it was one talking to diversity and inclusion. And I think even here, the fintech companies are doing that in a novel way. When we talk about diversity and inclusion as kind of emerging class of of banking sector, we're really talking about the platform, the product, and the people. And, you know, there's this, 2020 has been a sobering year, but it's also for us a year of affirmation and also this energy of we can't wait to continue being part of the conversation and what, I, what I'm calling, what we're calling, being more of an impactful financial services player. I think the one thing that we have seen in this conversation is that we can react regardless of the size of institution when the institution itself takes that upon themselves to really understand what's happening with their customers. Um, thank you for that. Huma, you know, let's go back to, to Rias and what's happening during the pandemic. Uh, you've seen 13% increase in your customers aggregating information uh, into your applications. and that, that mirrors data we've seen from MX and other aggregators that the people really right now, they need our help. They need our help to understand their financial condition. Mm -hmm. So so how has Radius changed uh, since the world has changed and turned upside down in March? So on our end, um, before COVID, we were seeing growth in our consumer and small business accounts. And uh, our profile of our clients was like, high average balances, uh, high card, debit card spend, and they were fully engaged with us. But during the pandemic, what we have seen is that um, in terms of the new account openings for consumer and small businesses, there's it's been double of that. Uh, we're seeing a lot more small, medium businesses who are going through an evolution in that they are more, uh, focusing more on digital accounts rather than going uh, banking. Uh, and uh, in fact, the industry stats are that there are around 30 million small medium businesses who have opened digital accounts um, since the pandemic started. Um, also, on the, the debit card spend, we've seen a significant increase. And um, Radius always has um, 
encourage healthy habits among our customer base, as in we wanted to always promote debit card spend over credit card spend. But we think independent of that, we've seen a significant increase in the spend by debit card. Uh, you mentioned about um, our PFM2, right? So we do see a lot more engagement there. And our customers are actually looking at the PFM2 to kind of understand uh, the holistic picture of their finances. They're trying to save more, and they're also kind of drilling down into the categorization to see uh, whether they can add additional categories as well as to understand where they're spending their money. So, um, and before that, they were focusing more on, you know, looking at their overall net worth and uh, overall spending. And so they were not that focused on actually trying to understand uh, their spend patterns. So we, um, similar to Lisa, I think it's all about trying to meet the needs of your customer's base. Uh, we haven't seen, uh, we haven't actually done anything different. In we are still remain digital. We, they're able to open their accounts in less than three minutes. But we just see a lot more uh, interest in digital banking rather than before. And uh, and that's uh, kind of the overall trend that we're seeing now. And it kind of makes sense with COVID and uh, the way the environment that we're in right now. Oh, that's great. Um, so, so Jesse, earlier you were talking about how you guys have reopened your office a bit and, and I don't see masks and anything like that. So so uh, is, is the other side of the world like, OK, now, you know, here in San Francisco, it's uh, it's it's quite. No. Story. So, <laughs> so uh, what what you don't see is so you can probably uh, if you, maybe you can look around. This is this is about the, the density that we have right now. Um, so, you know, uh, we have pretty, uh, pretty strict rules that, you know, you're allowed to you know, be at your desk with your mask off. And then, you know, the second you leave your desk, you need to have a mask on and um, you actually have temperature checks before you show up in the office. You have to sign in. If you've traveled out of state, you you know, we, we try to follow uh, the best practices um, from the, the CDC and, and from the New York, you know, New York State has done a really good job and getting in front of, um, getting in front of the, the virus um, since we had the outbreak in New Jersey is is following close closely, which is um, where I'm based right now. Um, but you know, I think it it speaks to the fact that you know at some point life goes on, and we're going to need to figure out how we exist and support our communities, how we exist and support our colleagues, how we exist and support our families um, in in whatever this new context is. And um, you know, one of the things that's in, incredible and and I think that is really important is all of the community banks have really stepped up and figured out how to serve their customers um, given these extraordinary circumstances. And, you know, as much as, you know, there's the the Zooms and the, you know, all the other tools that we have in order to enable um, interactions, the bottom line is it's it's figured out, we have, we've all the community banks have had to figure out how to humanize this whole situation. And, you still have people who have difficult times, right? You, you, you're trying to roll out digital tools to help them, but you also need to be able to be aware of, of what the problem is and, and how you can be a human on the other end of the line that, that helps them with their financial you know, problems, challenges, opportunities. And you know, the thing that we're proud of is that we continue to do that. And I think the thing that everybody on this call should be proud of is that um, it would have been a lot easier for us to step back and said, it's a difficult situation, You know, we can't do it. Instead, I think that it, um, everybody on this call, as well as you know, the vast majority of community banks in the U.S., have really stepped into the void and figured out a way to continue to serve their communities wherever they wherever they are and whatever form they take. Um, and we'll continue, right? Josh was right. This isn't going to be the last time that we have you know some type of extraordinary situation that we need to we need to manage through. The hope is that you know, can the tech that you know Across River brings to the table, can the experiences that Avaro brings to the table, you know, the stuff that Lead is doing, uh, stuff that that Uma is leading the charge with, you know, how can we make that less of an island, and and more approachable and 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 tangible to you know the smaller community banks out there? And, and there's a path forward. And I think that this pandemic has been horrible. Um, but it's allowed us to really think about growth in a whole new way and allowed us to understand that people can rise to almost any occasion. And, I, and if I could add something to that point, because <clears throat> a lot of people you know, tuning in are community, la community banks across the heartland of America. And you know, I think what we're sharing on this panel is there, there is something for everybody. You know, they're all digital, 
the old bricks and mortar and something in between. And there are solutions coming out there, either banking as a service, some of the platform players allow a channel to acquire loans where if your footprint is limited to two or three branches, there's still an avenue to broker loans. We're, we're all pivoting to payments because the demographics of the population, people are changing the way they work. And this is not a case of one segment of the financial services banking sector, you know, making another one irrelevant or pushing it out. There, there is a need for every type of institution. But, but one thing that's common though, is that we, we've got to embrace technology. COVID has shown us that that digital offering is tantamount to being around tomorrow. But there's also the human factor and there, there's, no, there's no magic in, you have to stay connected with the customer, whether that customer is virtual or physically coming into the branch. And for us at Faro, it's it's you know part of part of the magic is how do we delight customers when they come into the platform, and also respecting that the customers may have more than one choice of a financial provider, and there's there's a spot for all of us. Absolutely, you know I I love how all of your banks are able to serve your communities, and especially during this pandemic. And I'm really grateful for each of your efforts and. You know, I've worked in a credit union serving uh, people in Oakland. I've worked in a regional bank here in California, out of San Francisco. And I've worked for a global bank that uh, had its U.S. offices based in Boston. And each one of them really defined their community differently. And I think all of us are really changing um, based on this pandemic, but also changing because the business model is changing. So let's talk about, uh, you know, I'm going to wrap up with this, um, ways that we could support our clients and our customers and other financial institutions that may not have the resources that some of us have. Um, you've demonstrated some examples so far. How can we save that community making model? There's a lot of community banks, a lot of community institutions on this webinar and, um, this, this conference that we're having, and they all have their communities at heart but they all have the same kind of challenges that we do. So, so Jesse, let's, let's get back to you again. You, you talked about a little bit about how you could do this for um, smaller financial institutions in addition to FinTech. What else, what else are you guys thinking about doing to support the model? So I, I think that for us, it's about thinking about how you can take change. And instead of saying, you know, you need to think about becoming fully digital in 24 months and, changing your entire business model, that the change is something that happens incrementally if done right. And so how do you think about starting really small and changing something, digitizing a process, whether that means working with someone like CRB to figure out how you can automate ACHs or wires or, you know, all types of payments, which is fine, but, you know, or just start embracing something like RPA, like robotic process automation and thinking about how you can make yourself more scalable. So I think, very much the idea of how you embrace technology, how you become continually relevant and how you leverage technology, as, as Lisa said, is is by making it part of your DNA and making it part of the way that you think about enabling your business processes, how you think about enabling your customer experiences, that technology is not a destination. It's part of the journey. And as you continue to become relevant, as you continue to think about what your customers want and need from their financial interactions, Think about how you scope that down and apply technology to it in bite-sized chunks, right? You know, the, the biggest advice I give to every community banker I talk to is that make small investments that are foundational as opposed to listening to some consultant come in or, you know, some, some core provider coming in that telling you, you buy X, it'll solve all your problems. I guarantee you anyone telling you that is wrong and lying to you. Um, that the real way that you enable change, the real way that you support um, and really make technology part of your platform is, is making it part of your DNA. And that doesn't happen quickly, right? It's about evolution versus revolution and how you really get your people to think tech first, process first. And then, you know, you, you kind of make small investments and by the time you know it, you've transformed yourself. Absolutely, I love that. Um, what about you, Josh? You've got three physical branches at Lead Bank, um, you know, which, which are at the moment, how are what what are your what's your advice for for smaller financial institutions? Um, how do you go forward and how do you help them? Well, I think it's I think it it echoes what Jesse said. 
Um, you know, I would echo what Jesse said. But I also want to be really brutally honest. And I, I don't think th that anyone can, any community banker can stay in their bubble and assume that they have any relevance without technology. The fact is that our customers, wherever they are, are enjoying Netflix or TikTok or uh, Facebook. They are buying technology. They are seeing what technology offers them and it's offering them real value. And so to, to imagine that there is an alternative to what Jesse said, which is incremental, bite-sized, taking these foundational steps is, is delusional. Now, what do you do? How do you do that? I think the point is to really look at what is important to your customers, just as, just as we're all talking about. What are the, you know, as Lisa put it, what do people that are new to banking need? They, they've changed the way that they pay. They've changed the way that they pay their money. So community banker, are you, are you supporting Zelle? Do you promote and, and use Zelle? Do you promote and how do you serve other payment tools that your customers want to make? Because they are paying with Venmo today. And if you're not paying attention to the fact that your customers are using a PayPal app to pay money when they used to use your cash and your checks, then you're kidding yourself. Your own staff is using Venmo. And if your staff is using Venmo, what message is that sending to you? What, what indication is that to you? So I, I feel that it is possible, as Jesse's saying, that there are incremental things that you can do to begin to reboot your mindset around what is possible for you as a community bank. But it definitely means that you have a digital branch. Whether you know it or not, you have a digital branch. And it's time to embrace it and acknowledge it as a digital branch. Because people don't come into the branch anymore. But instead of bemoaning that fact, acknowledge that it's a strength. Right. And that you Josh, can build on that. Just to add to that, I, I think that your point is, you know, kind of the, 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 the salient point that I think I take away from what you're saying, right, is that it starts at the top, right? And so that if your leadership or you as your bank's leadership don't believe that this is the future, then your your people never will, right? And so you really need to think about how you create those visible artifacts of the world that is changing. And, you know, the digital branch is a great one. And even if, you know, you make something up and call it a digital branch, that's great um, because no one really knows what a digital branch is anyway, right? So um, the, the, the bottom line is, right, you know, think about what you do today that gets the ball moving, right? That sends a visible message to your people because if you don't do it, then they never will. Yeah. And just, I'll just add one, they are already doing it. They connected their own behaviors or your own behaviors to our institutions, to our companies. And if you make that connection, then, you, then, you're, then you're part of the way there. I think acknowledging that the industry's changed, the business models changed, and our customers changed a long time ago uh, is part of this. Um, final thoughts, Lisa, you, you've got more than 2 million customers, which is uh, a dream for even a regional bank sometimes. Um, how do you see you know, what you guys have done um, and what you will do with that half a billion dollars of venture funding that you guys have for growth? What's, what's next for you guys? I think what's next is to, to keep the mission and the purpose of why we're here for Varo. Don't lose sight of that customer. We're going to continue building on our capabilities and product offering and creating community. You know, we want people to come to the Varo platform and belong. And um, I think we also want to be a leader. We are a leader in the system. Um, you know, we win when everybody else wins as well, because we're a collective. And I, I think, you know, for the the community banks on the call, the credit unions that are, you know, a couple of branches, bricks and mortar or a regional player. Um, I think, you know, go digital, um, embrace it. 
Um, you know, early 90s, if you didn't think about the internet, that would have been difficult if you weren't thinking about it. You know, if you weren't thinking about the mobile phone, um, if you're not thinking today about payments and future technologies and, you know, all sorts of things we have to be prepared for, it's almost like an altered reality, physical versus virtual. But I, I want to end with have more conferences like this. You know, we learn by looking at others. We learn by getting introductions. You know, reach out to us on this panel. You know, FTT puts on a terrific conference, a lot of thought leadership. Come into their forums, have discussions, learn. And I, I think that's how we as a, as a full group can kind of advance everybody together. And know lastly that you don't have to build it from scratch. The technology and partners that are out there enable you to pivot for us all to pivot our business um, to the needs of the consumer and the needs of the marketplace. So I wanna thank you, Brad and FTT for having this conference. I think it's a great discussion and let's continue with the conversation. Absolutely. So, so wrapping up again, um, Huma, how do you see Radius Bank then as being part of this evolution of the business model? What's next for, for you guys and what's next for the industry? Yeah, so I think um, a couple of people talked about technology um, and how important that is to uh, well, not exactly replace a physical branch, but as, as an alternative solution in order to provide the right product um, for the consumer and small business. Um, it's so important. And then um, to Josh's point about um, how important it is for us to understand what our consumer needs are and how they're evolving, that also plays a very important part. So on our end, um, the radius is kind of focused on trying to understand um, uh, what those needs are. And uh, we don't see a one size fits all for category for uh, all our customers. Uh, we try to use personalization to address within our customer base. Um, for example, we see some customers who are initiatives, so or you know they want to kind of contribute to charity. Um, uh, so we have partnered with a non-profit, uh, March of Dimes, to offer a superhero checking account in order to give back for our customers. Uh, we also have a product called Essential, which is uh, targeted to the special needs of customers who don't have a credit history. And, um, and, and then within the small, medium business sector, right, you know, we try and uh, match the needs of those customers or businesses, the small medium businesses by offering them with a tailored business checking account, which is specific to their needs as well. Uh, on the FinTech partner side, uh, we also partner with our, uh, with the VAS uh, platform with all those FinTechs while addressing the specific needs of the larger community, which is could be an and so um, there's a different ways that we uh, are partnering right now, and that's just our vision as we continue to grow. That's fantastic. Superhero products and superhero um, methods and superhero futures for all of us is what I'm hoping. Um, what we've heard today is the story of four financial institutions of very different shapes and sizes, very different business models, and very different ways that we're helping customers and our clients. But what unites us is serving those needs. What unites us is serving them the way that they best know how, and that's by being very close to the customers and by keeping the customers and their clients at the heart of everything that they do. So I wanna thank Kuma and Josh and Lisa and Jesse for joining us and sharing your views today. And I wanna thank all of you for joining us in this debate. Um, you still have a little bit of time left to maybe go stretch your legs and, uh, have a, a sandwich or whatever else you're eating or maybe another cup of coffee. Um, so go go do that and come back to the main stage at 1.10 p.m. for a lively discussion that we're going to have on social media and financial services. Be well, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you.